Back in the 1970s and 80s, investigators could have suspect sketches, eyewitness accounts, and even a fragment of DNA left behind at the scene, but it didn't mean they could solve the case. Today, due to the fantastic advances in forensic techniques and technology, we are seeing justice for dozens of cases that were once deemed unsolvable. In today's episode, we'll be exploring five decades-old cases that were recently solved. Maureen Brubaker Farley. In 1971, 17-year-old Maureen Brubaker Farley was residing in Cedar Rapids. At night, she stayed in a rented sleeping room at 522 10th Street Southeast, while during the day, she worked as a waitress and visited her imprisoned husband. She regularly called and sent photographs to her parents and six siblings in Sioux City, as she hated being away from them. On Friday, September 17th, Maureen borrowed money for a pack of cigarettes. She planned to pick up her paycheck from work later that day when she knew it would be ready, but she never arrived. On Monday morning, she failed to show up to her shift and her boss reported her missing. Back at Maureen's rental room, investigators found very little to work with. Her car was present with a full tank of gas and a partially full pack of cigarettes, believed to be the same ones she bought on Friday, were accounted for. But there was no trace of Maureen. A week after she vanished on Friday, September 24th, two teenage boys discovered the 17-year-old's body on Ellie Road. She was dressed but shoeless, lying against the back window of a discarded car. They initially believed she was sleeping, but on closer inspection realized she was dead due to the condition of her body. Investigators initially theorized she was thrown from a passing vehicle, but didn't rule out the idea that Maureen had been carefully placed. A few days later, authorities speculated that perhaps she had been killed elsewhere, as they noted she bore no defensive wounds and that her feet were clean despite her lack of shoes. She died from blunt force trauma and they believed Maureen was taken by surprise. She had also been sexually assaulted before death. Following the discovery of her body, Maureen's case grew cold. Five decades would pass before a much needed break in the case came. On September 24th, 2021, authorities announced that DNA technology helped them finally identify the perpetrator. George M. Smith. They reached this conclusion by taking physical evidence discovered during Maureen's sexual assault examination and creating a complete DNA profile with it. While no matches were found with samples already on CODIS in 2017, investigators began collecting DNA of previous suspects. Although Smith had died in 2013 at the age of 94, authorities collected DNA from a relative and found their match. Smith had been investigated at the time of the murder, but there was insufficient evidence to prove his guilt. He had been in his 50s at the time of the crime, and many people identified him as an acquaintance of the 17-year-old, having met her at her workplace. He also worked at a liquor store near her residence. Investigators noted that on several occasions following the discovery of Maureen's body, he would ask the authorities for updates on the case, something they found to be suspicious. With Smith already dead, he of course can't be prosecuted for his terrible crime, and investigators have officially closed the case. Maureen's father passed away in 2002, but her mother and siblings are still alive and are relieved to finally have answers. Roxanne Wood. On February 20th, 1987, 30-year-old Roxanne Wood drove to her residence in Niles Township, Michigan after an evening of bowling. Her husband, Terry, had traveled in a separate vehicle and arrived back later. Walking into their home, he had no reason to suspect anything was wrong, but then he discovered his wife, dead, on the kitchen floor with her throat slashed. Investigators were called to the scene and discovered that a black utility door had been forcibly entered. Furthermore, a droplet of blood was found on the door, and it was later discovered that Roxanne had been sexually assaulted. Much like Maureen's case, Roxanne's demise was quickly ruled as a homicide and just as quickly went cold. The case was reopened several times throughout the following decades, first in 2001 and again in 2020. It wasn't until February of 2022 
that police finally managed to pin down the culprit. Students in Western Michigan University's cold case program were responsible for aiding in the identification of Roxanne's killer. They collected and sorted through piles of evidence, while other items of evidence were submitted to a forensic examination by Identifiers International LLC and the NSP Forensic Laboratory in Grand Rapids. These efforts eventually led the police to a suspect, 67-year-old Patrick Gillum of South Bend, Indiana. Following his identification, Gillum was surveilled extensively by undercover police and interviewed twice. During this period, he threw away a cigarette, which was collected by investigators so that his DNA could be pulled from it. This DNA confirmed that Gillum was, in fact, Roxanne's killer. Just days before the 35th anniversary of Roxanne's murder in February of 2022, the police announced that they had apprehended her killer and charges were being laid against him. In late March, Gillum pleaded no contest to second-degree murder and was also charged with breaking and entering an occupied dwelling. He was ultimately sentenced to a minimum of 23 years in prison, with a maximum of 50 years. Even if he only serves his minimum sentence, he will be 90 by the time of his release. He will likely spend the rest of his life in prison for his terrible actions. Diane Dahn Diane Dahn was just 29 when she was found dead in her apartment on May 2nd, 1988. A communications technician at the San Diego Transit Corporation, Diane was a mother of one who uncharacteristically didn't turn up for work one day. When colleagues went to check on her at her Santee, California apartment, they found her two-year-old son wandering around unsupervised. Moments later, they found her body in her bed. The police were promptly called to the scene, and Diane's demise was quickly ruled as a homicide. Small pieces of evidence were collected from the scene, and Diane's friends, family, and colleagues were interviewed extensively. However, no one knew of anyone who wished the 29-year-old harm. An autopsy revealed the mother of one had perished after suffering stab wounds to the chest, and she had also suffered from blunt force trauma. The case soon became lukewarm, then cold. In 2000 and 2001, investigators revisited the case. They had DNA samples that had been taken from beneath Diane's fingernails, but this failed to lead them to a suspect. In 2010, a hair found in her hand was processed. However, there were no matches in the federal database, leaving investigators, once again, at a dead end. The only thing investigators had learned was that the hair and the fingernail scrapings belonged to the same individual. In May 2020, detectives decided to turn to genealogy. Using this painstaking method, officers created nine family trees, consisting of about 1,300 individuals who were connected to the unidentified assailant by either blood or marriage. After conducting interviews and approaching individuals, detectives finally whittled the 1,300 names down to just one, Warren Robertson. Robertson was born in Arkansas, but spent some time living in San Diego. A local tow truck driver, he later left his family in San Diego and moved to Indiana in 1989. While it's unclear if he and Diane knew each other, he had been residing in the same apartment block as her at the time of her death. Robertson's name had never come up during the original investigation, and none of Diane's loved ones knew of him. In November of 1999, he died in a house fire, aged 39. Diane's son, Mark, thankfully has no recollection of the day of his mother's death. He is glad to finally have answers after 34 years of not knowing. Diane's sister, Victoria, shared this sentiment and praised the San Diego County Sheriff's Department for their hard work. The case is officially closed. Maurice Chivarella. On the morning of March 18th, 1964, Maurice Chivarella, nine, left home for school. She was a student at St. Joseph's Parochial School in Hazleton, Pennsylvania, and wanted to give her teacher, a nun, some canned goods for feast day. Maurice herself had dreams of becoming a nun and loved playing the organ. She planned on attending mass after dropping off the goods, but the nine-year-old never made it to mass, and it was soon found out that she had never even reached school just 10 minutes from her home. Later that afternoon, just after 1 p.m., a man who was out with his teenage nephew spotted something strange in a former coal mining pit, now a garbage dump. They both initially believed they saw a doll placed on top of the refuse, but on closer examination, they realized the doll was a human body. The child was quickly identified as the missing nine-year-old girl. She had been sexually assaulted, strangled, and dumped. 
Her hands were tied together with one of her shoelaces, and her ankles were tied with the other. Initial suspects in the case included a priest who was suspected of murdering someone in Bristol, Pennsylvania, and a local exhibitionist who took his own life when he was asked to take a polygraph test. Frustratingly, despite months of non-stop work on the case, the police were never able to identify a concrete suspect and make an arrest, and the case lay dormant for decades. Between 2018 and 2020, investigators teamed up with Parabon Nanolabs, a genetic genealogy company, and an Elizabethtown College student, 18-year-old Eric Schubert, who participated in genealogical research as a hobby. Eric had reached out to detectives after reading about the case, offering to help them comb through stacks of information to pinpoint a suspect. He built approximately 50 complete family trees to find a connection to Hazelton, eventually landing on a man who'd arrived in America in 1904. The man had two grandsons who lived in the area at the time of Maurice's death. While both men were dead, one was survived by a wife who provided a DNA sample which ruled him out. That left the older brother, whose remains were exhumed to reveal a perfect match. James Paul Fort, born in 1941, was a bartender from the Hazelton area. He was never married and never had any known children, and while he was never considered a suspect during the original investigation, he did have a criminal record. In 1974, Fort was arrested on charges of rape and sexual assault, but was given a plea deal for the less serious conviction of aggravated assault, and as such, spent only one year on probation. Then in 1978, Fort was arrested again, this time on charges of reckless endangerment and harassment. He lived just six or seven blocks from Maurice and had no connection with her family. He died in 1980 from a heart attack, aged 38. After 57 years, Maurice's killer was finally named and her case closed. Although her parents were not around to witness it, her sister, Carmen, and her brother, Ron, were glad to see it solved once and for all, with Ron stating, there's an emptiness there that's never going to change. But now that we do know, that helped close the door, which is a blessing. Candice Rogers. On the afternoon of March 6th, 1959, nine-year-old Candice Candy Rogers walked through the neighborhood of West Central in her hometown of Spokane, Washington, while selling campfire mints door to door. A member of the Bluebirds, the younger members of the Campfire Girls of America, she had seven boxes to sell, and her parents confined her route to the local area. But when she didn't return home when she was supposed to, Candy's parents immediately became alarmed. They notified the local authorities, but the only clue in the case was abandoned boxes of mints discovered close to the Fort George Wright Bridge. There was no sign of the missing girl herself. Over the course of the next week, Neighbors and locals assisted the authorities in their search for candy. Other participating groups included the Air Force, US Postal Services, and Boy Scouts of America. Two weeks after she had vanished, however, candy was finally found. Tragically, she was already dead. She had been purposefully concealed by pine needles and tree branches, and just one day earlier, her shoes had been discovered by hunters. Candy had been strangled to death and sexually assaulted. Strips of her clothing had been used to restrain and ultimately kill her. While hundreds of tips were investigated and dozens upon dozens were interviewed, no one was ever arrested for the crime and the case slowly ground to a halt. In the early 2000s, forensic experts were able to extract a semen sample from Candy's clothing, which allowed them to build a DNA profile of the perpetrator. Still, no matches were identified through CODIS and the sample prompted investigators to rule out their prime suspect in the case, Hugh Morse, who was not a match to the DNA. In February of 2021, the Spokane PD reached out to Orthram Inc., who have helped identify dozens of victims and perpetrators in recent years using forensic genealogy. And over the course of the next few months, experts within Orthram Inc. narrowed down the suspect list to three brothers, one of whom died in 1970, though he was survived by a wife and daughter. Detectives reached out to the man's daughter and she provided them with a DNA swab. Her swab showed a familial link to the attacker, specifically a strong paternal link. This was enough evidence for investigators to exhume the man's body and conclusively prove he was the person they had been searching for. After 60 years, the police were able to confirm the name of Candy's killer, John Hoff. He had previously never been connected to the case and at this stage, authorities are investigating whether or not he was responsible for other crimes in the area. 
He was 20 at the time of the attack and lived about a mile from the West Central neighborhood. Notably, he had been convicted for attacking a woman two years after the slaying of Candy. During this assault, he had forcibly removed the woman's clothing, tied her up and strangled her, though she managed to survive. He was sentenced to just six months behind bars and spent the rest of his life working as a door-to-door -door salesman and at a lumber yard until he took his own life, aged 31. And there you have the facts. Please leave a comment down below with your own thoughts and reactions. And remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you for watching. Stay alert, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.